With gold having recently hit a new all-time high, many viewers are wondering, what's next for the price of gold? To answer this question, I asked two of the smartest gold experts in the world to join me for an exclusive new interview. And in it, you'll hear their predictions for where gold is headed next, the good news and bad news for gold investors today. And perhaps most importantly, you'll get to see the inner workings of a powerful system for investing in gold, a system which has delivered audited gains of 706% for more than two decades, crushing the return of gold, the returns of major gold funds and more than doubling the S&P 500. To be among the first viewers to see this exclusive new interview, head to 2023goldrush.com. Again, that's 2023goldrush.com. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show here on Stansbury Research. Happy Friday. We are catching up uh, with Peter Grandich today of Peter Grandich and Company. Peter, uh, always good to see you. Welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure and been enjoying all your interviews. They've been great. Well, thank you, Peter. I uh, definitely want to get your insights on some of the latest news uh, headlines. Let's start with uh, just six days to go before the country faces a potential default. Now President Joe Biden and Republicans are 70 billion 70 billion away from settling their debt ceiling uh, quarrels. Peter, your take on the debt ceiling debacle. Uh, well, you know, it usually always gets settled. I feel like we've gone through this before. I think my, the bigger question here is with record tax collections, how did we even get into this situation? What are they doing with our money? Well, since the, the budget has only been balanced once in the last half century during the Clinton administration, and this is now going to be, I believe, the 79th or 80th time the debt limit has been raised. As parents, even though yours are very young, if your child could not stay within their means for a whole half century and had to raise their debt limit 78 times, can you really trust anybody with that type of be responsibility financially? I think that's always the bigger concern. It doesn't get spoken about. But the fact remains is that this is a government that has long since done away with any financial true responsibility on both sides. It doesn't come from one party or another. And they'll, they'll come to an 11th or 12th hour uh, agreement and uh, they'll kick the can again. The problem, Danielle, is one day they're going to go kick the can and it's not going to move. And uh, we're closer to that day than any other time before. It's probably going to not be able to be kicked maybe once or twice more. We cannot continue to have tr multi-trillion dollar budget deficits. It's hard for me, Danielle. I started in 1984 in the brokerage business. We were the world's largest creditor nation. And if anybody said to me then, Peter, 40 years later, you're going to be having an interview and be talking about potentially now in the next 10 years, $50 trillion in hard debt, not counting Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security, it, it, be, it just boggles the mind, and there's really no financial responsibility anymore, not only just in federal government, but on many state and local levels as well. Wow. So you wouldn't have believed it had I told you, you know, 40 no. years ago this would be. You could have never imagined or fathomed the mess we find ourselves in. Yeah, I never thought we'd be using tea to describe debt. It, 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 if people would just try to understand what a trillion means, and we have 32 trillion of them right now in debt, we're getting to the point, Danielle, where, and it's serious. And this isn't scare tactics. I don't have some hard asset thing to sell or to, you know want people to buy some guns or ammo for me. But the bottom line is, we're getting to the point where servicing the interest rate is going to become the interest is going to become a huge problem. Uh, our best year, 2019, just before the pandemic, I think we took in about 4.6 trillion. I think the number was. I could be wrong on total revenue. We'll be looking at if we get to 50 trillion, where the CBO says we're heading, uh, and we put a 5% interest rate on it, we'd have half our total revenue going just to pay the interest on our debt, which is unsustainable. Can't can't function that way. So somewhere, is in, and certainly in your lifetime, I'm a little bit older than you, but certainly, unfortunately for your children, especially, we're going to face a far worse crisis than we're going through at this moment. One day at a time, Peter. You no, know, it's want to ruin your day, but uh, no, it's. I mean, it's already so much to digest. One one has to think. You know, how much worse can it get, Peter? Well, 
just ask somebody 10 years ago, you know, that's right. This is not, there's been a wide range of, and you have many of them on who've talked about this issue for years. And, uh, it probably went a lot further than most of us imagined before it got acute, but we're really in the acute stage now. And how I know that, how I decide on myself that's the case, is because many people in the world now are trying to disassociate themselves from the United States. That's why there's such a movement to join the BRICS and, and other things like that nature, because people realize the, the end is in sight now, and they, they don't want to be forced down with it. They want to get swim further enough away from the sinking Titanic, yep. so when it goes down, they're not taken with it. Well, you, you brought that up, so I, I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on that, because a lot of people are dismissing the growing power of the BRICS, saying, okay, whatever, they don't count or, or, or can't overtake the U.S. Uh, what do you think of that attitude? Well, I'm certain during the Roman times, there were Roman leaders that said, don't worry about it, we're going to be kings forever. And I'm certain there were people in Great Britain that once said, hey, don't worry about it, we're always going to be the world leader. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a total change. I don't know if we're going to get a total replacement. I can tell you this, which I'm certain in my own heart, is that we are going to have competition. We've already seen the dollar erode in terms of how much it's used over the last 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's going in the wrong direction. This particular administration, I think, has helped accelerate it to the direction. So whether or not it's a formal change or just a competition, there's no question about it. And, and, and this is a thing that most financial advisors, I find, cannot decipher. They don't understand the geopolitical ramifications on what's happening. Just look at the Middle East. Uh, it wasn't too long ago when it at least acted like we were welcome in open arms. We're not anymore. Uh, we're seeing countries that weren't even speaking to each other coming together because they want to move away and disassociate with that's the United true. States. And that's just one part of the world. We can go in other areas. So the geopolitical ramifications are just as severe as the potential monetary ramifications that's coming down the pipe. I want to talk inflation now because just when the Fed thought, hey, maybe we're winning the fight, inflation stinks stubbornly high in April potentially reinforcing the chances that interest rates could stay higher for longer. This is according to a gauge release Friday that the Federal Reserve follows closely. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, which measures a variety of goods and services and adjusts for changes in consumer behavior, rose 0.4% for the month, excluding food and energy costs, higher than the 0.3% uh, Dow Jones estimated. So, uh, your thoughts on, on the inflation uh, fight, Peter. What's your take on inflation and where does the Fed go from here? What do they do next? What do they do next? Well, they haven't managed to do really anything right for several years now. Let's just think about it, just starting from the pandemic. When they flooded the uh, economy with all sorts of money and there was political pressure bar none for them to do so, uh, it, it's economics 101 if you ever study money that you can't put all that money into a system and not expect we're going to have some inflation from it down the road. Then, of course, the, uh, the, the battle for supply has become acute. People realize that all the things that we think and they'd be readily available weren't, so that helped rise prices. But then let's not forget they actually had a chance to act, and instead they said, no, there really isn't. They used a word that I'm certain has been taken out of the dictionary down at the Fed, and that's transitory. We'll never hear a Fed official use that word again in our lifetime. They missed it there, too. And then when they did start to raise interest rates, are they telling me that they had no idea that these banks like SBB and others are out there with substantial paper losses? Because after all, they, they, they're supposed to monitor them and be following it. So I, I, get, I, I think people give the Fed too much credit. I, I find it very uh, concerning that there are the people responsible for our monetary and have really been on the wrong side of things most of the time. And, and you know, there's been people that have called for the dismantling and all that's just not going to happen. But I can tell you that I would be, uh, I, I would certainly listen to more private forecasters that I follow before I listen to anybody and believe what I'm hearing from the Fed is the truth. So when you say they must have known that uh, the banking crisis was coming. What do you think happened there? They're just turning a blind eye, they're ignoring it, or they're completely out of the loop? Probably a combination of all of that, Danielle. I mean, think about it. Uh, we know in no the last November, there was a huge uh, survey done by the Fed of banks, including SVB, and they got a, they got a check mark. No one said anything. 
And that problem at SVB didn't just start after November, but it's not alone. And, and let me tell you this, the, the, the biggest concern I have is this talk of insuring all depositors. If you want to open up a can of worms, just make that the case. And if I'm running a bank, I'm going to turn to my other partners and go, listen, let's buy soybean futures. Let's, let's gamble. Because after all, if we lose now, the Fed's going to step in and, and guarantee to all our deposits. The worst scenario. You have to remember, the deposit insurance was created for the small person, the person that didn't have a lot of money, that they can have safe of mind and not be concerned and have to put it under the pillow. And people that they now want to assure and that they bailed out, believe me, most of those people, even if they took the losses that were losses, were still going to live a better life than you and I are living right now. Peter, you know what's interesting, bringing it back to interest rates, I read, reread the Fed minutes from the other day, and if you read them, you'll think, you'd think, oh, it definitely sounds like they're ready to take a pause, right? But then, based on uh, um, uh, this gauge today, uh, the Fed might say, hey, we're not happy uh, with what we're seeing yet on the inflation front, and we might hike again. So it, it's, 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 it's not clear to me, is it to you, what they're going to do? I think this is the most toughest one to call that we've had to call in the last year. I think you, there's ample reason to argue that they should at least pause. One thing that is clock kind of going against them is they don't want to get into the real presidential race environment and, and have to be raising rates if they don't have to. Uh, that, that's one environment. So there may be a thought in their mind is, hey, even though we don't maybe need it, let's just do one more to be certain. And then by then, hopefully all the other things that we're hoping to turning down are turning down. So that's, that's why I would call it a, a flip of a coin right now. But I think what's important to recognize in it is, is that they still destroyed the fixed income market. It is still a challenge, even though very, very short term interest rates are up. It's still very hard for someone to secure themselves with guaranteed income that's above inflation. I mean, think about it. The 30 year is under 4%. And at best, because I don't believe the inflation numbers that come from the Fed to be 100% truthful, at best, we may get down to 4% in inflation. The 2% number, we would need a depression to have that number again. So I, I think there's still issues no matter whether they pause or continue rising. One thing I think it's important to remember, this time last year, the don't worry, be happy crowd on Wall Street was already predicting by this time they were having already flipped. And that was the reason why you were supposed to buy stocks last year. Right, that hasn't right, happened. Right. And of course, they pushed it out another year now. And, and like a broken clock, I guess they'll be right one of these days. Well, I was going to ask you, let's play out the scenario that the Fed does take a pause. What does this do to stocks? Uh, you know, will markets rip here? Well, I've not been in the camp that still exists at, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent more to the downside. But I'm also not in the camp looking for a 50 percent upside move. I think markets are basically going to get locked into trading ranges for the foreseeable future. And I mean, for the next few years. One thing I'm fairly certain, and of course, for my own self, I've gone, I've approached it that way is that we're not going to see the type of returns that were offered the past 10 or 20 years. And that's going to impact a lot of people, especially people that retired, because they built their lifestyle and their plan based on that. And I think we're going to see that become more challenging. But I do think that there's enough bearishness already out there that they'll use the settlement of the debt and potentially a, a pause to get a, a fairly significant stock market rally. But it'd be a rally that if I was still long a lot of general equities, which I'm not, I would use to, to come get out of, not to increase my exposure. It, explain to me why people are on the sidelines when it comes to gold here, Peter. Why, why is gold not moving higher? I've said this to you before. Uh, maybe others have said it. I don't know. But Wall Street treats gold like kryptonite. It flies in the face of the typical financial advisory service to talk about gold because they make their living handling stocks and bonds for people, financial assets. So to tell someone that you need to buy something because what you own may not work out is just something they're not about to do. Plus, there's not a lot of way for them to keep getting turnover once somebody buys physical bullion. Uh, it, it's a sales organization, and I think it's okay. It's not saying that they're all liars or illegitimate, but... I don't think we're ever going to see Main Street approach gold. What I think is important for gold right now, what's the best ever, and I've been at this almost 40 years, is what used to be the biggest nemesis to gold has now become the biggest supporter, and that's central banks. 
Central banks have been buying gold for a lot more reasons than a trade. Uh, I think it's minimally to diversify away from the dollar because they see the handwriting on the wall. But I also think that they believe eventually for this worldwide debt crisis to be solved, there's going to have to be some type of backing to future reserve currencies. People aren't just going to accept it without any type of something to fall on. And always remember this about gold. The one thing it's got going for it that no other investment I know of has, it's no one else's liability. And I, I always say that's a critical thing. So uh, I don't expect them to ever get it. I do think when we eventually will, and we will, we've been locked in this trading range and the highs near 2100 are still there. But when we go through it, and I think it's a question of when, not if, then momentum traders will come into it. I think something that happened that didn't get a lot of uh, press, the very fact that BlackRock, which is really the right arm of the, of the government now, in my opinion, took a stake in, in a silver uh, ETF that's not theirs. It's a competitor's. They took a, almost a 5% stake. I think that's the first signal that at least major institutions, people with big bright eyes, with big, big pockets, are starting to recognize that gold and silver are going to have to become parts of everyday portfolios. Just uh, thoughts on what's happening over in Europe. I mean, we see uh, Germany now entering uh, into recession um, as last year's energy price sh uh, shock takes its toll on consumer spending. So, you know, with Europe's economic engine now breaking down, how fast will this spill over to the rest of Europe? Well, I think because they have a loose unification. I mean, they've, they've been a mess for quite a while. I don't think that's going to change. I think the big question, and I don't have the answer to it, Danielle. I, I know it's shocking that a financial person doesn't have an answer for everything. But uh, the bottom line is, the question is, what's happening in China? We're getting two different signals. On one hand, we're getting that while it's not as great, things are getting better and they're going to get loose. And, they're, you know, they don't have a lot of inflation so they can have monetary expansion. Then we also get reports recently, and that's what kind of helped create a copper for the moment, is that things are really turning soft in China. And it's hard to tell because a lot of numbers are suppressed and a lot of things are inflated or kept, uh, you know, massaged or what have you. But I think the, the, the mover of the world economy uh, is going to be, if you can tell me, look a year forward and tell me what China did, then I'll tell you what basically most other economies did. You mentioned financial advisors before, and I thought I'd bring up this article. I was curious to get your take on it, Peter, about JP Morgan is now developing a chat a GPT like AI service that gives investment advice. So could 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 chat GPT replace financial advisors one day? How how shocked would you be to see that happen? Well, Nobel laureates have done studies that showed 80 percent of money managers underperform an index fund. So, you know, it's not like they're going to be replacing Everybody's a superstar doing this. But the concern I have about AI goes back to if you're young, you didn't see the movie. But in the 70s, the movies came out it was called 2001 Space Odyssey. And it brought up a debate about could machines ever replace man and what would happen if they do? And it was more like just science fiction at that time. Well, it's not science fiction anymore. We just saw the other day, I think, the first salvo of what can happen on the downside. An AI group, uh, an AI, whoever it was, created an announcement that there was a, an explosion near the Pentagon. And it made it look so real that all the breaking services that now rush to beat everybody else put it out in the, the stock market swoon for a few minutes. The problem with AI, not only is it what's helped keep the stock market up this year, because if you remove the performance of AI stocks out of the S&P 500, it's actually down for the year. But the real concern about it is, is how much will there be a replacement of people's employment opportunities, and what does that do in, in, in a world where still uh, most people work, you know, paycheck to paycheck? What, what's going to happen with that? It certainly uh, has reason to understand how you could, in a sense, replace someone where they're using a mind, not their hands. They're not going to ever replace an electrician because you have to have somebody physically do it. Maybe they'll right. get robots to do that someday. But anybody where you're this supposedly is what making your, your employment, it falls into question now. And I don't think, here's the thing that I'm really concerned about, Danielle, when I, just before I nod off and go to sleep. Mankind has always managed to do wrong things with great inventions. 
And I think the big concern here is how what this artificial intelligence can do to, to, to the human race. I don't think really anybody has an understanding, but the few people that have some idea, like, like, like Elon Musk, they, they, they have it an understanding yeah. of how damaging this could be. But I think that's going to come out right now. It's bullish on Wall Street and, you know, people can make money on it. So they'll just run in and not worry about the long term ramifications. Right. But I think the potential long term ramifications could be perhaps, you know, the worst thing that ever came about in mankind. Just quickly, Peter, you mentioned Elon Musk, so I need to ask you the other big news this week. Uh, DeSantis uh, making his presidential uh, run official on Twitter, choosing Twitter. Uh, uh, why do I think you have an opinion on this? Thoughts on, 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 on DeSantis? I think, the, I think it's impossible now for the two sides to really come to agreement to do anything of worthiness. Uh, there is such hatred. It's not dislike anymore. It's actual hatred and on both sides. And... A certain amount of people who are predicting that, like somebody that believes Trump can win, it's because they, in a sense, want to get revengeful for a way that they think everything's been done wrong. And then there's a group that think that's the worst person that could ever possibly be in to be with. And let's do whatever we can, include lie, cheat and create create stories. So the politics of here and abroad are going to play more of an impact on our investments than any time in the modern era. It's just, it's unfortunate, but it, that's the way of the world. So the discussions you'll be having in the next six to 12 months will become more about politics than probably in, since you started doing this. Just Absolutely. Just uh, Peter, let's end on a lighter note here as we head into the Memorial Day long weekend. Possibility of, the, of a Super Bowl for, for the Jets? Could it be the year? Aaron well, Rodgers. Well, you are a Jet fan and your husband. And- <laughs> If you, I don't know if you can see it back there. Seventy three is going into the Hall of Fame. That's my biggest uh, happiness in all of this. Joe Klecko, I've been blessed to be great friends with and be in business with for over 20 years. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, they have a better chance with Aaron Rodgers being quarterback than they did Zach Wilson. But if, as you know, as a Jet fan, you always <laughs> say by December. I can't believe that happened. And I'm just I just can't have so confidence true. enough that sometime in December you're going to go. I can't believe that happened. So let's wait. But they certainly have on paper look a lot better than they have in recent years. Peter Granditch, thank you so much for joining me this Friday. Happy long weekend, friend. So good to see you. Same here. And and lovely to see your children growing up and milk it now because before too long, they're going to be asking you for the keys to the car. So I hold them tight. I hold them super tight. Uh, Thank you, Peter. And thank you all for watching. Want to wish all our viewers a very happy long weekend. And we will see you next Wednesday. In the meantime, don't forget to sign up at DaniellaCombone.com to stay on top of all this great content. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.